Good afternoon, this is the Wolsey Peak Wilderness Area, and that would be Wolsey Peak. I still haven't found a way to get to the top of that. Maybe I should try a helicopter. So I'm going to stop here, kick some stones out of my boots, and talk some anime. The third Pat Weber movie, W13. Pat Weber is a collection of sci-fi mecha stories set in the near future. Pat Weber imagines a future where large robots, called Labors, are used for heavy construction and dangerous work. To deal with labor-related crime, or crime where just Labors could be useful, the police department formed the Special Vehicles Division, the Patrol Labor. Pat Labor has been seen as a manga, a light novel, and an anime. The anime premiered in 1989 as an OVA, spawned a TV series, more OVAs, and a pair of movies all in the early 90s. About a decade after the second Pat Labor movie closed its anime run, Bandai and Madhouse announced they were going to make a new Pat Labor movie, WXIII. That's part of the Ruminal 13, by the way, usually called W13 or Wasted 13, or just the third Pat Labor movie. Naturally, Pat Labor fans were delighted, but as a Pat Labor movie, this turned out to be a little bit of a disappointment. While Wasted 13 is set in the same world as Pat Labor, and the familiar characters from SV2 and their Pat Labors do make a short cameo appearance, none of the original cast are featured characters in this movie. This is a Pat Labor movie of a very different kind. That doesn't mean it's a bad movie, it just means that our preconceived notions of what a Pat Labor video should be aren't going to be fulfilled, and this one will have to earn our respect from scratch. So, in this story, something strange is happening in Tokyo Bay. There have been several instances where underwater labors have been destroyed, sometimes for those that are manned, killing the pilots. Is this industrial sabotage, eco-terrorism, or something else entirely? Veteran Detective Kasumi and his young partner Hara are assigned to the investigation by the Tokyo Police Department. Most of the main plot follows their investigation as it leads through puzzling causes, mysterious motives, and corporate cover-ups. Hi. Good morning, detectives. Ugh. You mean to tell me that this is all that's left? Yeah. As an important side story, Detective Hara is also trying to pick up a pretty young woman he just met, Saiko Misaki. As to our view of the Pat Waver characters, well, Noah and Asuma have a five-second cameo early on at the crime scene just to tease us. And Captain Goto shows up in civvies for an off-the-record conversation with Detective Kasumi to pass on some information about the case. And later on, they join the story for about 15 minutes near the end, and we even get to see the mecha for a bit. However, these appearances are pretty much incidental to the story. This is Kasumi and Hada's, and a little bit Psycho's story. The story will concern our suspicions about what's destroying these underwater labors only 30 minutes into the film, though some of the details will take a while to become clear. We'll also get to observe the actions of players other than the lead detectives, which will give us more information than the detectives have sometimes. Then we have to wait for the detectives to catch up to us. That limits how much mystery and tension the story can generate, and Detective Kasumi's aha moment isn't that big a breakthrough. The film just never generates the same sense of urgency, mystery, or high stakes as its predecessor Pat Labor movies. In addition to main plot, another subtext runs through the movie. It's a contrast to the older Kasumi's analog ways to those of his digital age partner, Hara, and it's a contrast of the characters dealing with personal loss and loneliness. But I think some of Detective Kasumi's backstory may have gotten left out of the movie to its detriment. His crutch is as much a metaphor for his spirit as for his physical leg injury, but the backstory isn't developed enough to really pull that off. We never find out how his leg was injured or why his family left him. For those looking for a timeline, this movie takes place sometime after the TV series and the first movie, but well before the second movie. The animation is by Madhouse, and it's really excellent. The backgrounds are detailed, and the scenes are well composed. The animation is fluid and very credible. There's lots of beautiful artwork here to look at, and the visuals are often used to tell the story rather than handing us information in dialogue. Most of the artist group called Headgear, who created the original Pat Labor video, are absent this time around. Original manga creator Masama Yuki is credited with the basic story, but the screenplay is by Miki Tori, who hasn't done Pat Labor before. Since the classic characters are barely present, 
it probably isn't important that the regular Pat Weber writers aren't here. This is director Fumihiko Takayama's first work on Pat Weber as well. He has done plenty of excellent work on his own, such as Gundam 0080. Here, though, he tries to imitate the style that Mamoru Oshii brought to the first two Pat Weber movies, including using lots of reflections and inserting montages of everyday scenes set to music. But all this is superficial mimicry. The montage scenes play too early, before the mystery is deepened, and too often. Therefore, instead of adding to the mood of the story, it kind of gets in the way of the storytelling. That's intended to show us Detective Kasumi's solitary, highly organized lifestyle, which it will later contrast with Detective Hata's more disorganized style, and later with Saiko Misaki's style. Headgear character designer Akemi Takata is still credited with the designs of the original Pat Weber characters, but they're just bit players here. All the new characters are provided by Romi Takagi. Likewise, Itako Izuguchi's original mecha designs are still used for the brief appearance of SV2, but plenty of new designs are provided by Hajime Takoki, who worked on Gundam 0083, and Shoji Kawamori, who designed for Macros, Ghost in the Shell, and many other anime. It's not that any of these artists did a poor job, quite the opposite, it really looks nice. The unfamiliar staff just illustrates how far this movie strays from Pat Weber's origins. So, it's no surprise that none of the original Pat Weber musical themes reprise from Kenji Kawai's original score this time around, even though Kawai wrote them too. If you've never seen a Pat Weber video before, that won't stop you from enjoying this movie. In fact, it may actually be an advantage when watching it, since you won't be burdened by expectations that this movie won't fulfill. The original Pat Weber characters only make a one small appearance at the end. I've often thought putting the Pat Weber title on this movie was a little bit of false advertising. But taken on its own terms, I give this Wasted 13 movie four stars. On the surface, it's a simple police protective procedural, with just a little touch of the weird. It might remind you of an episode of Fringe or The X-Files, but paced a tad more slowly than those American TV series. But it's also a very nice character study of its three main characters. In fact, the movie might have been better off without the Pat Weber characters at all, whose arrival in the final ten minutes is almost a distraction from the primary story's climax, which isn't really about sea monsters or giant robots. Pat Weber Wasted 13 was first released in North America by Pioneer Genian, and that's now out of print. Pioneer's English dub worked fine for me this time, since the original characters had such brief roles. The only time I missed their familiar Japanese voices was during a brief conversation involving Captain Goto. Thanks for listening!